first question of how do infectious diseases affect populations. This is called the field of epidemiology. If we take a full population and we divide it into a group of people that have enjoyed good health and a group of people that, in, that is in a state of ill health, this proportion changes with time. And we would like to have some idea of how to predict a curve like this, where this is a proportion of infected individuals or ill individuals here on the y-axis and the time axis over here on the x-axis. So the field of mathematical epidemiology refers to the models which guide this particular field. So epidemi epidemiology is literally the study of what is upon people and is concerned with dynamics of death and disease in human populations. And this is a plaque commemorating the Black Death, which entered England in 1348 through this particular port and killed between 30 and 50 percent of the population at that time. So what research in epidemiology tries to do is to identify the distribution, the incidence, and the etiology of human diseases to improve the causes of, of diseases from our understanding and to prevent their spread. And the word etiology refers to the study of the causation or the origins of disease. So diseases, again to remind you, can be infectious or non-infectious. An equivalent word is communicable or non-communicable. An infectious disease is caused typically by a bacterium, a virus, or a parasite. In addition, you could have diseases caused by worms or misfolded proteins or prion proteins. And the word infectious or communicable simply means that other people can get them from you. On the other hand, non-infectious diseases typically come from genetic causes, from some deficiencies in the diet, from lifestyle, etc., or various combinations of these different causative effects. And other people cannot get them from you. So if we were to categorize diseases according to infectious and non-infectious, cholera is bacterial, H1N1 is viral, dengue is viral, malaria is parasitic, HIV AIDS is a viral infection. And all of these, you can categorize them as viral, bacterial, parasitical, worms, misfolded proteins, etc. Non-infectious diseases, on the other hand, diabetes is metabolic disease, scurvy is a deficiency disease, anemia, hypertension, cancer, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, obesity. All of these are diseases that cannot be transmitted from person to person, are the consequence of genetic factors, the lifestyle with which you live, and other factors such as diet. Okay. So here are ways in which people can get diseases from other people. One is through direct contact between two persons. The other is indirect contact, where an infected individual comes and touches, for example, a doorknob. And then someone comes in later and, pick and touches the same doorknob and picks up a bacterium or virus from that contact. The droplets, for example, when someone sneezes, is one way of transferring an airborne disease from person to person. And airborne through the sneeze is, in fact, a little more general because someone who comes by a few hours later can also, it doesn't have to involve direct contact at the same time, but even contact at different times can be mediated in this particular manner. So this is some ways in which both bacteria and viruses can be transmitted between human beings. And they can also occur through contaminated water, for example, cholera. There's also ways of transmitting diseases that involve intermediate vectors, for example, mosquitoes which transmit malaria and fleas which transmit the plague. And some diseases come to us from animals that are, in fact, a normal host, such as rabies. And the disease called MERS, or the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, likely originated in bats and camels before crossing over to human beings. A bit of history that says that infectious agents have probably always caused disease in humans. And there is many historical records dating from about 2,000 to 3,000 years ago that describe, for example, smallpox in old Egyptian and Chinese writings. And smallpox is likely to have been responsible for more deaths than all other infectious diseases combined. And malaria, leprosy, and polio are known to be ancient diseases, come from a long while ago. There are many records of diseases being very crucial contributors to the collapse of civilizations and to the destruction of whole armies. For example, the defeat of the Aztecs by the Spaniards through smallpox between the years 1519 and 1520. The pandemic flu in 1919, which affected India considerably. In fact, India was the worst affected in terms of deaths, with 15 million dying in one year. So this totally involved between 60 to 100 million deaths spread across both uh, in the Asian subcontinent, Europe, and America. But more recently, there have been large-scale epidemics such as SARS, bird flu, Ebola, and others. So a few words about the history of epidemiologists who led to the creation of this field. And one well-known name is the name of John Snow in, in 1854 who studied cholera, an outbreak of cholera in London. So he was the son of a coal yard laborer who became a doctor, and then studied this particular epidemic that took place in these, between the years 1848 
1849 in London and identified for the first time water pumps as being sources for cholera. So the way he did that was doing what is called uh, this particular type of spatial epidemiology where cases, these little circles here, marked cases of cholera. And also on the same map, he marked the positions of pumps. For example, pump A, a pump here, pump C, another pump here, pump B, and so on and so forth. So then the question from a purely visual point of view is try to try to identify if there is any relationship between the individuals who fell ill and the locations of the pumps. So here you can see that pump C has no individual ill near it. This pump here has no one near it. This pump here has a few people here. But over, over, overall, there's a much larger proportion of people in the vicinity of pump A than anywhere else. And that also includes this particular gap here, where strangely there are no, in these two buildings here, there are no people who've fallen ill with cholera at all. So this led him to conclude that the Broad Street pump, which is the pump A on Broad Street, was a primary source of infection with cholera. And the two blocks that were unaffected were found to have their own source of water. And they were also supplied with alcohol because people who stayed here were members of a brewing company. Once the pump was removed, the outbreak ended. And there is certainly what went into this analysis was no knowledge of the causative agent, either of bacteria or viruses involved. But it certainly identified water as a vehicle for transmission of the disease. So here's a map of India where I have marked certain cities, Kasoli, Almora, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bangalore. And these cities have a special history, special place in the history of infectious diseases. And first of all, Ross, who lived between 1857 and 1932 and won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the life cycle of the malarial parasite. But he considered his work in mathematical epidemiology to be more important. And the Almora connection comes from here. He was born in Almora. He was educated in England and then joined the Indian Medical Service working in both Bombay and Kolkata. But when he was posted in Bangalore, he noted the connection between water and mosquito control and observed the first stages of growth of the malarial parasite in the mosquito. And he initiated models for malaria epidemiology. But all earlier work on mathematical epidemiology due to Bernoulli, Ross, and many others is largely contained in a model that was written down by two Scottish mathematicians, one of whom had an Indian connection. And this is the most famous and well-known model of infectious diseases today. And it guides all of our thinking, essentially, about how people transmit infectious diseases from person to person. And this model is called the SIR model. And we'll come to explain that in some detail a little later. So the SIR model is due to two people, McKendrick and Kermack. McKendrick was born in Scotland, trained as a doctor, and joined the Indian Medical Service. He was the director of the Pasteur Institute in Kasoli. So that's where the Kasoli part of the map comes in. So after he went back to England, he was superintendent of the Royal College of Physicians Laboratory over a period of more than 20 years. He was a very clever mathematician, said this is said about him. Although he was an amateur, he was a brilliant mathematician with a far greater insight than many professionals. And Kermack, on the other hand, worked as a chemist for many years, although trained as a mathematician. But after he was blinded in a lab accident, he began a fruitful collaboration with McKendrick. And about him, it's said that he had an altogether exceptional sense of algebraic form, in addition to a very penetrating sense of mathematical significance. So he had to do all of these calculations in his head because he was blind. So here is some data which is taken from a plague outbreak in Bombay in 1905. This is the number of infected people in time. And this is time from the point of the, at which the epidemic is noted to have started. So it's just, you can see that it rises to a maximum and then comes down here with a little bit of noise in that particular region here. So once the outbreak was over at week 30 over here, which is July 21st, 1906, some fraction of the population had become infected and were recorded as having been infected. So here is the fit of the Kermack, the Kendrick theory, this line here, passing through the same point that I showed you earlier. And this is probably the most reproduced figure in, the, in all books on mathematical epidemiology. Just to illustrate what is the point of, of doing epidemiology, you would like to understand the course of disease, the natural history of disease, how it affects people in a population, how it ebbs and rises. And this would be a very good example of how simple mathematical model can be used to very precise and important effect in understanding the course of a disease and presumably predicting for future diseases what to do, what, what to expect from that disease, and what the possible intervention might actually do. OK, so a few words that I will use. If a microorganism has an adverse effect on another organism, for example, a bacterium causing a disease in man, it is said to be pathogenic. 
And the reservoir refers to the natural environment in which a pathogen typically lives. It could be water, it could be soil, it could be in human beings. A population is, we will be talking about diseases at the level of population, not at the level of the individual. So population is some complete collection of individuals with some characteristic in common. For example, they may all live in the same place and therefore be able to transmit disease from one to the other. The frequency of, of occurrence of a disease in a population is governed by a term called determinants. There could be a large number of determinants. Some of these can be controlled, some of these cannot be controlled. One determinant might be the, the presence of polluted water that everyone drinks from or other types of air pollution. And some of these determinants can be manipulated and the disease reduced or the frequency of disease reduced through the manipulation of these determinants. An epidemic is a disease that occurs in a population in excess of what is normally expected. You may always expect some background level of cases of a particular disease, but something that exceeds that by two orders, orders or three orders of magnitude might be called an epidemic. In an epidemic, disease events are clustered in time and space. That is, they all happen. People begin to fall ill at the same time in the same place. And that's what really defines an epidemic, an increase over a background in the number of people falling ill that is confined to a place in a so therefore, there is some element of correlation in the people who fall ill. They, can, they contract the disease from each other. So let's now begin to describe models for infectious disease, which is the main point of this set of lectures. So first of all, remember that we will start, people are individuals. So all of these are differently colored. And all individuals are heterogeneous. They're not the same. But they can be classified at some extremely simplistic point of view with their status with respect to the disease. So that's the origin of the classification of an individual as susceptible, infected, or recovered. We have in mind the fact that people's susceptibility to disease are not all the same. They could be different. The way people contact other people is not the same for everybody. But we will ignore many of these effects and then try to put them back in later when we discover more and more complicated and more and more realistic models for disease. So we will start by taking individuals who we know to be heterogeneous, and first classifying them very simply as infected, susceptible, and recovered. So these are their status with respect to the particular disease that we want to study. So the definitions are susceptible is an individual who is not exposed, not infected, but who could become infected. He, is not in, he or she is not immune to the particular disease. An infectious individual is someone who can transfer the disease. We will always be talking about infectious diseases, remember, that can move from person to person through the action of the transfer of a bacterium or the transfer of a virus. So that defines an infectious individual. We will call this I. So susceptibles are S, infectious are I. So you can see these labels here, I, S, and the last label, R, which is recovered. A recovered individual is someone who has recovered from the infection, has become well again, and will not become sick at, a, at any later point, will not become susceptible again. So sometimes this is also called removed, because one way a person can exit this class from, of, of the infectious is to die. So it will be essentially removed from that population. But people can use, you can use either the word recovered or renewed interchangeably. So now what is done is to take these individuals here and assign all of them to what is called a compartment. This whole class of models are called compartment models. And they're called compartmental models because we ignore the fact that these individuals, there is a certain granularity to these individuals. We will say that we will just count the number of individuals here, here, and here, and refer to that as S, I, and R, the count of these individuals. So we assign each of these individuals to individual compartments and label them accordingly. So the number in each of these compartments, labeled as S, I, or R, is the fundamental quantity that we would like to model. We would like to know at a particular time after the initiation of the infection, how many infected people are there, how many recovered people are there, how many susceptible people there are there. So if you add up the number, if the population is closed, that is to say there are no people dying, so not removed but recovered, and there are no births or deaths, so there are no new individuals in the population, then the number of susceptible plus the number of infected plus the number of recovered must equal the total number n. So that's like a conservation law on the total number, which can't change. We can take these and divide by n to get small s equal to capital S by n, small i equal to capital I by n, small r equal to capital R by n, to find fractions of the total population m in each compartment. So for example, this could be 20%, 30%, and 50% at the division at a particular time of people in these each of these different compartments. 
So then S, I, and R are limited to say between 0 and 1, the way that they have been normalized by N, because the maximum value they can take is 1, is N for capital S, which means 1 for small s, and similarly for I and R. We can allow for demographics in these models. That is to say, you can allow individuals to be added and removed. For example, new susceptibles could be born and injected into this compartment. Susceptibles could be removed from this compartment. For example, you could have deaths in this compartment, this compartment, and in this compartment, in which case the numbers in each of these compartments would reduce at different times. So you could have both births, you could have deaths, as well as you could have numbers increasing through immigration into a particular area. For example, if you looked at a large city where increasingly where population increases by a few thousands or tens of thousands per day, you could have immigration contributing to the pool of numbers in the susceptible or the infected or even the recovered compartment that is shown here. So you could allow additional removal in these compartments, and then you would have to specify a rate at which you add or remove as well as an additional complication to these models. To make the model more realistic from the point of view of disease, it's easy to do. All you need to do is to add additional compartments that reflect that. So here is the example of an addition of one compartment called the exposed compartment. A susceptible individual can become infected by going through an intermediate stage in which that infection, that individual is exposed to the, has contacted the infection, but does not manifest clinically and is unable to transfer that infection to anyone else. So the, the person is beginning to fall ill, but has not fallen ill completely yet, at the sense of being clinically diagnosed as being infected. So this is S. This is the exposed compartment E. This is the infectious compartment I. And this is the recovered compartment R. So E stands for exposed. So now you can see that it's easy to complicate these models by just adding different additional compartments. So here is an additional compartment, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. And this is a carrier compartment. So the carrier is someone who does not manifest the disease anymore, who can now move around, who's not sort of ill and confined to bed, but still carries the disease in the sense of being able to transmit it to other people. The famous carrier is typhoid Mary, was one example in, in New York, the early part of the century. And you can see, again, the logic is whatever is epidemiologically sensible or clinically sensible is in terms of how the disease affects an individual can be added as a different stage in these compartments. So here's one more. Here is a hospitalized compartment over here between susceptible, exposed, infected, hospitalized, and then a compartment that for dead but not buried. And then finally, R would just be completely dead. So here's an example of what would happen in the case of Ebola. In Ebola, patients remain infectious even after they die because Ebola is transmitted through bodily fluids. And the handlers, people who handle the corpses of, of individuals who have died of Ebola, are themselves susceptible and have to do that handling very, very carefully. So this is an unusual example because even though the individuals would be conventionally called removed from the population or dead, they can still, info, they can still influence disease or the progress of disease in mm -hmm. other individuals by being infectious towards them. We will consider what are called well-mixed populations, that is, here are all these individuals, S, I, and R over here. For concreteness, we will mainly describe the SIR model. Okay? So the assumption of well-mixed says that an infectious individual has an equal probability of contacting any of the other individuals in this population. So one way of thinking about well-mixed is in, in, a, in a chemical reaction, you say that any chemical component can interact with any other chemical component in a, in a small institute of time, in a small instant of time, because you're going around mixing the container in which they carried to circulate all of these chemicals, ensure that their distribution is uniform through this. So this is an important assumption that has to be improved upon later. But in a sense, this is sometimes called a mean field assumption in modeling in physics. And this well-mixed mean field, et cetera, et cetera, are useful approximations to arrive at first level descriptions of a particular model. So here, the assumption is that all members of the population interact equally, and that any one individual can contact any other. So now let's just get on to describing the models before we write equations for them. So the first and the simplest model is called the SI model, which just has two compartments, the susceptible compartment and the infected compartment. I will use a notation in which a solid line denotes a transition from one compartment to the other. So a susceptible individual is taken from here and moved here. Then the number of susceptibles goes down by one, the number of infected goes up by one. 
Okay, so that's denoted by these dark arrows, the solid line arrows here. So this is an arrow that shows the transition between S and I, and here's another arrow that shows the transition between I and S. The dotted arrow is an influence. That is to say, the rate at which S becomes I is influenced by the number of I's. So the two, the notation that I will use is the arrow, the solid line, the solid line with an arrow at the end of it, defining a direct transition between compartments, and the dotted line defining an influence that affects the rate at which you move from one compartment to the other. So here's a model that we will spend a good amount of time discussing. This is the SIR model. So this has a susceptible state, an infectious or infected state, and a recovered state. And here, that the influence is from the infected to the susceptible, to this particular arrow that defines the transition rate at which S becomes I. Okay. So let's do more complicated models. The SIER model has susceptible, uh, this uh, exposed, infected, and recovered. And here, the influence is between the infected and the rate at which susceptibles become exposed on this particular So we can convert all of these arrows into equations later. But this is just to ensure that you understand the structure of these basic compartmental models, how we define the arrows that, that interpolate between them, that mark the transition between them, and the use of those arrows. Here is the SIRS model, the susceptible, infected, recovered, and back to susceptible again. And this defines an SIR model in which you lose your immunity over time. So a susceptible individual can become infected. This is the direction of the arrow of influence. An infected individual can become recovered. And then the recovered individual can go back all the way to the susceptible compartment. So this is SIRS again. Here's a much more complicated model. This is called the MSEIR model with births and deaths. So now we have put in demography we allowed for compartments to change their numbers based on people being born and people dying. So the M here refers to infants with passive immunity. Okay, Passive immunity means that they are, they are uh, immunized against the disease through antibodies that come from the mother. Okay, So births with passive immunity enter the M compartment, reflecting infected with pa passive immunity. But after time, in over a period of about three to four months, that immunity wears off, and M goes to the susceptible compartment again. You can have births without passive immunity if the mother has not contacted the disease and does not have antibodies towards it. It can give rise to babies who have who are born without passive immunity, in which case they go directly into the S compartment. You have both addition and subtraction. You can have deaths from the M compartment, deaths from the S compartment. In fact, deaths from any of these compartments that are listed here. But of course, you can have births only into these two compartments because these represent the infant compartments. Okay, So from here, you can go to the exposed compartment, from the exposed to the infected, from the infected to the recovered. And these are transferred from one compartment to the other, which were denoted by the solid line earlier. And this represents a model for a disease in which, again, partial immunity can be contracted from the mother, but individuals can lose that immunity and then enter the standard SEIR sequence, as it were, and also allowing for the fact of having births and deaths, the demographics within this particular model. So now let's come back to the SIR model, which I said is the model that we'll be discussing in more detail here. S, remember, is the number of susceptibles, I the number of infected, and R the number of recovered. What we would like to do is to write equations that tell you how these numbers change in time. So for example, ds by dt is a change in S with respect to time, di by dt is a change in I with respect to time, dr by dt is a change in R with respect to time. And these are equal to complicated function of S, I, R, and other parameters on the right-hand side. So there could be some function here, some other function here, some third function here. And then the question is, what are the forms that the terms F1, F2, and F3 can take? And the quest will now be to find reasonable arguments for discussing the structure of these functions F1, F2, and F3. Okay? So we could have added other terms here, for example, second derivative terms in S. but these are simplifying assumptions that we will make. If we had a higher order term, that would mean there would be some memory of earlier states. But if we want to write models in which the changes at a particular time are Markovian, they only depend upon the variables at that particular time, on the i, s, and r at that particular time. So that we're constrained to make these first order equations in s, i, and r. They will have this particular structure that's shown on the right hand side. So how do we interpret s, i, and r? Do we think of them as absolute numbers, or do we think of them as densities? 
So here's an example where I have 1s and 4i is here, and 1s and 4i and, and sort of 5i is in a much larger context here. So here you might imagine that if you were thinking of these as densities, the dense, although the numbers here and the numbers here might be the same, the densities here are certainly different between this, this figure and this figure. So one interpretation of the way infected and susceptibles interact with each other is that you should just think of them as the number of individuals per unit area. Then if you wrote down an equation as such as ds by dt is proportional to i times s, replace the proportionality constant by an equal sign putting a minus beta i times s here, then if s's and i's were a number per unit area, then the beta would have a dimension of an area per unit time, just dimensionally speaking. So the traditional nomenclature for an equation that looks like this is mass action, because this is the way you would write an equation in a chemical context. So the, the change of the concentration of a particular chemical with respect to time due to a reaction between, say, two other chemicals would be a concentration here times the concentration here with some rate constant that sits out at the top. So concentration is upper volume. Here it's per unit area, because we sort of think of people not wandering in the third dimension, but on some surface. Now, this particular way of describing it is called pseudo mass action, if you choose S and I to be numbers and not densities directly. So, if one thinks about this, one realizes that the rate at which you have new infections in a population is the product of a contact rate, the rate at which people contact other people, the proportion of those contacts that infectious people have with susceptible people, and the proportion of such contacts of these particular context between infection and susceptible that actually lead to infection. So it's a multiplicative product of a bunch of different probabilities of various things happening at each stage. So the assumption that underlies the mass action is that the contact rate is directly proportional to the density. Okay? But there is another interpretation which says that assume that the contact rate is independent of host density. And if you assume that susceptible infected hosts were randomly mixed, this would lead to transmission following beta times S times I divided by N. And the divided by N is a new factor that enters there. So there is an argument for this. And the argument is that on average, each susceptible makes the same number of contacts regardless of the host density. Typically, you don't meet everybody in a population. You meet some small group of people who, who surround you, maybe 20 or 30 or 50. That does not scale with the fact that the population can be as large as you want it. So a proportion I divided by N of these is of infected hosts. Given a population of N with I infected, the proportion of the people that you meet is basically I by N. So then this mode of transmission is called frequency dependent transmission because it depends upon the frequency of contacts. So in epidemiology, the force of infection is the rate at which susceptible individuals acquire an infectious disease. So going back to that earlier description of beta times S, beta times S times I divided by N, this would then be with frequency dependent transmission, beta times I divided by N, multiplying S for each S. So here, breaking down that relationship a little more, S is susceptible, I is infected, R is recovered. So ds by dt is proportional to S times I by N. The proportionality is beta. So it's beta times S times I by N. The minus sign says that susceptible numbers go down as people become infected as they move from the susceptible compartment into the infected compartment. If you don't allow bursts into the susceptible compartment, you can only have losses from it. The number can only decrease which accounts for the minus sign, because then beta is, can be defined to be positive. So beta is some time scale, if you look at this equation here, reflecting the rate of infection or the contact rate between people. The number of susceptibles decreases, which accounts for the minus sign here. And this i by n gives you the fraction of the infected population that we discussed just now. So once, so this is the equation that tells you how ds by dt behaves, minus beta times s times i divided by n. But what happens to the infected people? You can argue that those infected recover at some rate. Typically, you recover over a period of about four days to five days from some viral infection. That happens independent of who you contact, whether you contact someone who's infectious again or recovered or susceptible. This is, happens independently to every infected individual. So this is just says dr by dt is proportional to i, the number of recovered gains from the number of infected who then recover, and it's proportional to the number of infected with a time scale gamma that sits out there. Okay. So here is an example of what happens if you look at it in terms of the pathogen inside the host. Over here, at the start of infection, there is no pathogen inside. It rises here over across an incubation period. This is the infective period. So this is the latent period where the person is in, is in the E or the exposed compartment, does not infect other people, is, does not manifest symptoms yet. 
But this is the infective compartment here where you have a peak and then a decline in the abundance of the pathogen in the host. And then it comes down at this point here, you are tended to have recovered, even though you still might have some amount of load of bacterium or virus inside your bloodstream. And this is the point at which it decreases to zero, and you can be said to be in the recovered compartment. So this is how SEIR manifests in the overall amount of pathogen contained inside your body and how it rises and it comes down. And you can use this to define the start of infection at this point, the start of symptoms at this point, and the abundance that is required for transmission at this point over here. There is some minimum amount of minimum abundance of pathogen that is required before you can begin to transfer from person to person. So let's put all of this now into the equations again. So first of all, the decrease in the susceptible population, ds by dt, as we said, was minus beta times s times i divided by n. That's our first equation. Now we have justified the minus sign. We have justified the one by the i by n factor that enters here. And this is proportional to the number of susceptible that you had in the first place. So there's really no way of getting away from a term that is like this. Susceptibles, once infected, move to the infected compartment. So everything that is lost from here must reflect here as a gain in the infected compartment. So over here, there must automatically be a term that is just has the opposite sign of the term that is contained here. So that must be a plus beta times si divided by n. So that the, all that says is that anything that leaves the infected compartment and enters the recovered compartment, and enters the, 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 the leaves the susceptible compartment that enters the infected compartment, a loss here must be balanced by a gain here. But over a somewhat larger time scale, infected people recover over a time scale 1 by gamma. The number of that recover is proportional to the number of infected itself. And this is the loss from the infected compartment. But these people who are lost from the infected compartment are lost because since people are not allowed to die in this particular model, they move to the recovered compartment. Therefore, there must be a corresponding gain term in the recovered compartment, which is gamma times i, which reflects the loss term from the infected compartment, people moving from infected to the recovered. There's this interesting and simple symmetry to these equations. For example, just add up these numbers here, ds by dt plus di by dt plus dr by dt. You can see that for every term that appears here, there's a term with the opposite sign. So this cancels with this, this cancels with this. So all that says is that d of s plus i plus r by dt must equal 0. But s plus i plus r is a constant. It's the total number inside the population. So the structure of these equations ensures that this particular condition is maintained, and that n doesn't change in time. This assumes that there are no births and deaths, and the total number across each compartment remains a constant. OK, so now we wrote down the simplest possible model that accounted for how susceptible individuals could be infected by infectious individuals. And we put in numbers over here. So th there are two parameters that enter here. One is a parameter called beta, and one is a parameter called gamma. And gamma is the infectious period, the time over which an infected person remains in the infected compartment before moving to the recovered compartment. So once I tell you about beta and gamma, that characterizes a disease at the simplest level of modeling in terms of the SIR model. So now one can ask the question, if there are a few infected persons initially present, what determines if the disease will spread to epidemic proportion within the population? You can ask how many people, or what, la what fraction of the population is infected as a result. You can ask, can the, population, can the infection come back to the population after it has gone through once? And what does immunization do? What does vaccinating some members of the population actually do? Okay, So we want to ask all of these questions in the context of this simple model. Because we have said that once we think about putting people into these compartments, and once we have decided on a minimal set of compartments, either SIR or SEIR or MSEIR, et cetera, et cetera, once we have that, we can write down equations that represent how those numbers change in time. We can use these equations to answer precisely these questions. How many infected people are there at time t? following the onset of an infection, in which a few people started out with are infected. So one can take these equations that are again shown here and then do this analysis numerically. These are nonlinear equations because s, this is a quadratic term. It's s times i. So these equations have no general analytic solution for any alpha and beta over here. But now you can see what happens numerically when you start with an initial population in which n minus in one individual are susceptible. And you can add one or two individuals who are infected. So you can see that the susceptible individuals here, for this choice of parameters, which is not described here, but it's some alpha and beta. We will understand the significance of beta and of, of the beta and gamma a little later. 
Over here, you can see the susceptible individuals comes down to a low value here. The infectious individuals, initially there is one person who is infected who is able to transfer the infection to other people. That number rises and then comes down here. So this is the, this color here refers to the infected population. And finally, the recovered population starts off from being zero, where there is essentially no one who's recovered at all, and slowly increases as infected people gradually recover from the disease that they have. So these equations can't be solved in closed form, but they can be done very, very simply in, on, on a computer. So now what happens if you fix gamma? So gamma is fixed to be 1 in the set of simulations, but vary beta. So now you can generate a whole bunch of different curves. So the largest values of beta show the sharpest onset. So over here, what is plotted on the y-axis is a fraction of that are infected, which is i. So we have normalized them to the total population. So the fraction varies between 0 and 1. And you can see that as the larger beta is, the, very sh the much sharper the onset is. It rises up. It, in fact, it rises to a larger and larger value the larger that you make beta. So for beta equal to 9, you have the largest value here. If for beta equal to 8, 7, 6, etc., so you have smaller and smaller value, as well as the peak of the curve shifts towards the right. Beta equal to 0 is interesting because that even if you have one person there, that infection doesn't rise. It just comes down. For beta equal to 1, is a sort of marginal case where it barely stays there. But for beta greater than 1, that's when you have this characteristic rise and this fall that you have. So that suggests that you can model different types of diseases, the onset, the number of people infected, for example, that's proportional to this maximum here. So the number of people who are infected at the peak of the infection, then the rise of this infection with time, all of these can be modeled with appropriate values of beta and gamma. So that suggests that for a particular disease, if I want to understand the course of that disease using the SIR model, I should try and find out what is the appropriate beta and gamma that correspond to that. And gamma, of course, is an infectious period that's easy to extract from clinical data. Beta relates to contact between individuals that's a little harder to extract. But then the question is, is it beta and gamma independently that are important or some combination of beta and gamma? So that's what we now have to look at to examine if that is the case. There's one reason why you might think that a combination might be more relevant. And that's you can scale out the gamma. The gamma is an inverse time scale. Just by measuring time in units of gamma, you can set gamma equal to 1 thereby leaving only one parameter, which is your beta there. So that suggests that there may be a simplified way of thinking about these equations, which we can now get to. And that's, again, what, what, this, what this graph it shows is the existence of a threshold value of beta, as I discussed just now. So for large beta, in disease infects more people than it started out with before it dies out. For small beta, it tends to die out altogether, monotonically. So let's approach this question, so starting with these equations here by saying, assume S is approximately equal to 1. So these are all, uh, I've divided capital S by N and relabeled re it as capital S. So all S, I, and R vary between 0 and 1. So if I set S equal to 1, then this basically becomes beta minus gamma times I. So this is the equation for the change of I with respect to time. And all I've really said here is that the number of susceptibles is so much larger than the number of infections that I can approximate it by its almost asymptotic value of 1. So di by dt now becomes beta minus gamma times i. Now the question of whether i increases or decreases from its initial value can be said very simply in terms of the fact of is beta min minus gamma, is it greater than or is it lesser than 0? So whether i becomes bigger or not depends upon the sign of beta minus gamma. Equivalently, I can take beta over gamma and look at and ask is it greater than 1 or is it, or is it lesser than 1? If it is greater than 1, the infected numbers grows. Whatever number you started out with, it can only increase from that point on. So this ratio is so important that it has its own name. It's called R0 in its own, it has its own symbol called R0 in its own name, which is the basic reproductive ratio. So this has a particularly simple in interpretation. This is roughly the number of people that one sick person will infect on average, called R0. So you can look at the values of R0 for different diseases. For example, Ebola has an R0 of about 2. Hmm? And swine flu has a number of about 2. HIV has 4. Smallpox has 7. Measles goes way up at 18. So one person with measles can infect approximately 18 other individuals with the same disease, precisely because it has a much larger R0. Okay, So Ebola, as we had mentioned earlier, is not particularly contagious, but it's highly infectious. And this reflects this difference between Ebola and measles is reflected in the changes in the reproduction number. 
So now we can take, as I said earlier, define these all of these scaled by their numbers, define them as i and r again. This is the form that is called the SIR model. And s and i and r must all be less than or equal to 1 in this particular way of writing the equations. So if we said that if this is the infectious fraction and susceptible fraction, s and i, since s can vary only between 0 and 1, i can vary only between 0 and 1, and the sum of s and i must be less than 1. So that's this line that I have shown over here. That So all of the states of the model must be some point contained inside this particular triangle. Okay. So this is because s plus i is bounded by 1. It cannot be greater than 1. And therefore, any point here, that bound reflects the fact that all these points, all physical points must be below this particular line. So here is a phase plane portrait for this particular model, for the classic SIR model, with some value of R0, which is 3 in this particular case. We say if you start with some number that is susceptible and some comparable number that are infected, this is how those numbers change with time. So finally, the susceptible fraction winds up here, and the infected fraction has now gone to 0. So from the structure of these phase plots, you can figure out, given that you started with a particular value, where do you move to? What is the nature of the curves that take you across, the trajectories that take you across to your final state? Okay. Well, a few more details about this model, and then we'll stop. First of all, I can look at these equations here, ds by dt will minus b beta si, di by dt, dr by dt. And then notice that if I take one equation and divide it by the other, take the ds by dt equation divided by the dr by dt equation, I can cancel i from here and get ds by dr is minus beta by gamma times s, which is minus r0 times s, because r0 was defined as the quantity beta divided by gamma. This I can integrate by taking this s below. So ds by s is minus r0 times dr. Integrate on both sides, log of s t minus log of s0 is minus r0 times r of t minus r of 0. Or s of t is s of 0, exponential minus r0 times r of t. This is straightforward. Now, because r of t, the number of recovered at particular time t, is always less than 1, s of t can then be easily bounded. It can be bounded because I just need to replace this by the largest value that it can take. So s of t must always be greater than or equal to s0, exponential minus r0. But this number is always greater than 0. So this immediately tells you that not everyone will be infected. There will always be some fraction of susceptible greater than 0 that are inside the population. So disease die out, not because susceptibles run out, but because the infectious numbers go down. And this is important because precisely the opposite was believed earlier in the earlier modeling between the 1700s and the 1800s about how diseases spread. People believe that once everyone who was susceptible succumbed to the disease, that would be the point at which the disease naturally left the population. But that's not true. There will always be some number of the fraction of the population that remains. And the number that remains is basically it involves the exponential of the R0 factor that enters here, as well as the initial population. Okay? So that's all in this lecture. In succeeding lectures, I will talk a little bit about how to make the model more complex how to look at consequences of, for example, what does vaccination do within the context of this model? How does it affect uh, the numbers of people? What is herd immunity? A few mathematical results that relate to this particular model. And then we will go on to discuss various other types of complications that we can add to this, looking at age structure models, looking at networks, looking at types of agent-based ways of approaching this particular problem. Mm -hmm. So this has been a quick introduction to the SIR model with a little introduction to how it's relevant to understanding the broad contours of how the disease spreads within a population. And we will do more interesting things as we go along.